Cory Booker of New Jersey, for example, directly testified against him, something that does not happen very often, while Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts was shut down by Majority Leader Mitch McConnell when she suggested that Sessions was a racist. Much more on the Sessions confirmation and the reaction from Hugh Hewitt. That's all coming up. But first, comparing the Trump administration to the Third Reich is apparently so two weeks ago. This week, in a new twist, USA Today published an editorial claiming there are alarming similarities between senior White House advisor Steve Bannon and ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Justification? Apparently both see the battle between the U.S. and radical Islam as a clash of civilizations or something. We're joined now by David Mastio. He's deputy editorial page editor at USA Today. David, thanks all for coming on. Thanks for having me. So I don't think we're overstating. The, the, the lead of this piece is basically uh, the claim that Steve Bannon and al-Baghdadi of ISIS share a similar worldview. Um, in fact, that's a verbatim quote. So I want to want to play a quick game with you. It's called, Who Did It? I want to put up on the screen the record of Steve Bannon and al-Baghdadi. Okay, so I'm just going to go quickly through and we're going to see who did what. Number one, beheaded journalists. Okay, Baghdadi. Use chemical weapons on the Kurds, also Baghdadi. Employs child soldiers, another for Baghdadi. Mass executions of Christians. Declared a caliphate. You're getting uh, the point here. And by the way, I don't think Bannon has murdered a single Yazidi. So I get that you don't like Steve Bannon. Totally legitimate. Problems with Steve Bannon, I understand. But comparing him to the head of ISIS, over the top, no? No. The problem with, the problem with Steve Bannon is that he shares a... A, danger, a dangerous idea that plays right into the hands of al-Baghdadi. Al-Baghdadi wants the war in the Middle East to be between all of Islam and all of the West. We're at war with a psychotic death cult, a fringe of the Islamic right. world. And Bannon agrees with Baghdad, Baghdadi that it is war between Islam and the West. We don't need to give Baghdadi that propaganda victory. And when the strategic advisor, or the strategic leader of the White House bumbles into giving a strategic victory to our enemies, that's a really big deal. Okay, I, I guess just a couple of obvious points. One, presumably, Baghdadi is talking about a literal war, indeed he's waging one, whereas Bannon is talking about some sort of metaphorical war because he hasn't, as previously noted, done the things we listed on the screen. He hasn't actually committed any atrocities Baghdadi has. Therefore, well, neither, you know, it's neither an entirely has different neither scale. Has, neither has Barack Obama, neither has, neither has Donald Trump, but all three of them are leaders of the United States in our war with this fringe death right. cult. Of, of El Baghdad. Right, no, that, Just that, because that, they don't pull the trigger doesn't mean that they're not responsible for the war. Well, I mean, Bannon's been there in a matter of weeks. I mean, that, that, you're not yeah, accusing him true. of atrocities, are you? No, yet? Cer certainly, oh, okay. so I certainly just, well, not. I want to take your, your accusation seriously, but I just first want to establish that saying that he shares a similar worldview with the head of ISIS is really disproportionate in scale, and it's overstatement, and it, and it diminishes, I think, your point. That's my view. You disagree. But let's get to what you, you said here. You're going after him in part for using this phrase in a radio interview. He said, Bannon said, quote, religion is not a, Islam, rather, is not a religion of peace, but of submission. Now, I think you'd agree as a journalist that truth is a defense, and as it turns out, the word Islam comes from the Arabic root for the term that means submission. And so, why is it out of bounds to say that? It's not, it's not out of bounds to say that. And, of course, in the piece we talked about many of his quotes. And, of course, we that had, was the first one we had, you listed. We had, we had, an invest, we had our investigators uh, listen to hundreds of hours of, of his, uh, his comments on his radio show. And the overarching idea that, he is at, that the West is at war with all of Islam, that that it's not just a fringe death cult of, of murderers and crazies that we're after uh, is, is, at the, is at the center of his ideas, and okay, it's but, but you're, you're skirting a direct question, though, and that is, you listed this after the many hours your investigators, as you just said, listened to his tapes. You came up with him saying, Islam is a religion of submission. And I would just remind you that according to Islamic scholars, including those in this country, that's literally true. So why would you include that in the piece? Why is it offensive to say something that's literally true? What's wrong with that? I, if, that if that were all that he said, 
that that but, would just be that would just be a statement of fact. But you're you're included in you're a four hundred word piece, so like you're why completely put that in there? you're completely dodging the central argument, and you're oh, not no. you're not answer, you're not answering the argument. Oh, how oh. is how is the we've how got is, time? I'm how, just asking you to are, respond to how, something that you wrote and explain it. How okay. how is the West at war with all of Islam? How does that advance our goals in fighting the Islamic State? and al-Qaeda and the other horrible terrorist groups that are all across the Middle East. Well, if you're asking me that question directly, I would say that demonstrably the West is not at war with all of Islam, or even with a large percentage of Islam. But I guess what well, then I we, then objected, we agree. I, uh, but then what we I objected agree. to, hold on, but here's, here's the problem with your piece and with so much of our dialogue on this subject is that it treats actual truths as verboten. There's something naughty about saying something that's literally true. And what's literally true is, as Bannon, and far be it for me to defend Bannon, I'm just telling you this, we said, and you noted it, he described what Islam literally means. We should be allowed to say that without saying, oh, that's wrong somehow. Moreover, the truth is that ISIS is fighting what it believes is a religious war against the United States and Israel and other primarily Jewish or Christian countries. They see it in religious terms. And why is it wrong to say that out loud? Because, once again, it's true. If we had picked that one phrase and wrote an, edit an editorial about how that one phrase was horrifying... Oh, you included it. You that... still haven't explained why, but why did you include that? I, in, in the context of the editorial, it is... It, it's all explained, you know. Well, right right you're there. on TV there's, now. Tell me, tell me why that's okay. Whatever. You're obviously not going to answer the question. You're not going to answer the question. I'm just. But you're making the point that it's somehow well, wrong. You're, you're still, you're still dodging the central point. In fact, you've agreed with the exact reason that we have criticized uh, Donald Trump's advisor. Now, the, the question for the saying question that Islam is, when is religion at peace, for saying that there's a religious component to it, that is that is true. And if you can find a quote where Steve Bannon or anyone else in the administration says we're at war with all Muslims, I will say on TV that's insane and it's untrue. I would never defend that. That's that's just not accurate. But I don't see you didn't produce any quote like that. Instead, you produce quotes like the one that I've repeated three times and you haven't accounted for. So just to the point. You seem uncomfortable with acknowledging what ISIS has no problem acknowledging, which is they're motivated by religious fervor. It's Islamic religious fervor. They don't speak for all Muslims, far from it, but they're still acting out I, of what I, they see are legitimate Islamic beliefs. I absolutely agree with you that they believe that they are an is Islamic Islamic group, but the West is not at war with all of Islam. And okay, every, but no every, one's, every, uh, has, has Bannon said, has anybody in the administration said the West is at war with all of Islam? I mean, that's a nutty statement. And again, I would never defend that. That's insane. Well, has anybody it, said that? Cite, it, cite the time and place and I'll denounce it. But you can't because they haven't, as you know. So come on, let's just be adults here for a second. They didn't say that. You're creating a straw man. Let me ask you this. Do you think that ISIS is waging what it believes is a religious war. And if you don't, then why are they targeting and murdering Christians? Why did they we, eliminate we, all 60,000 of them in the like, We never, we, we didn't write anything saying that, that ISIS does not believe that they're fighting a religious war. Okay, so what what is wrong with saying that they're acting out of what appear to be religious motives? How does that hand them a propaganda coup? Why is Steve Bannon or anybody because in Washington... Because that's not what he's... That's not, that's not what... That's not what he is, he is saying. Okay, well, tell me what he's... I mean, just give me an example of what you think is wrong that he said. It's not in your piece, but perhaps you have a reserve from all the, the research your researchers have been doing. I want to know. If you've got someone at the NS, sitting in an NSC meeting who think we're, we're at war with Indonesia, then that's like a massive problem for all of us. So reveal the information that you've gathered and, and convince me that he's the same as Baghdadi. Do you have Tuck, it? Tucker, this is, this is a... This is a cheap shot. I mean, I can't it's sit not here. It's a cheap shot. I, you just I, I can't a piece sit here. The guy to help back daddy, no, and I'm saying back I, it up. I'm I'm one I'm one editor on an editorial board. I didn't write this piece. You just made that up. Oh, okay, you didn't write the piece. I'm sorry. I assumed you were coming to speak on behalf of the editorials. If you're on the editorial I, I, board, I if, if you're here, an editorial, am, that's fine. I, I am here. Either. I am here to speak speak on behalf of the editorial board. And in fact, we told the White House and we told Steve Bannon that we were writing this piece. We sent them emails and and asked them to to write an oppose write an opposing view. They chose right. They chose not to. Okay, what, I mean, whatever, maybe, I don't know, maybe they should have, I, I don't know, I don't run USA Today. So let me just ask a couple other questions, I'm just interested in them. So the idea is that 
it's crazy to be worried, and I think you basically say that, that his, his dubious theories about clashing global, global religions, his, quote, overwrought fears. Now, he may have overwrought fears. I don't really know him. Maybe he does. But a lot of Americans are kind of worried about the expressions of Islam they see on the news every night. And they're thinking, if these a lot of people like that come here, it's bad for America. You think those are overwrought fears? Why would people have those fears, do you think? Well, I can certainly understand why people think that there's an extreme fringe of Islam that, that we need yeah. to fight. That's something that Republicans and Democrats have agreed, agreed for a long time. But in order to thrive, al-Baghdadi and the Islamic State need to convince a broad population in the Middle, Middle East that the West is after them. And we don't need to give them that, uh, that propaganda victory. Okay. I mean, I, I've heard that a lot, but we've had two presidents in a row, George W. Bush and Barack Obama, both of whom, as you noted, went out of their way to say religion, Islam is religion of peace. We're not at war with all of Islam. And, you know, they, they kind of repeated that message like every day for many, many years, 15 years. And yet ISIS still took over a huge portion of the Middle East. And yet they were fought back, not with propaganda, but with, you know, weapons. So where's the evidence well, that this kind of... We, 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 know, we, know we know exactly why the Islamic State took over a big, a big swath of the Middle East. Any, any listener to Fox News knows why, because okay. President Obama withdrew our, our troops prematurely right. from Iraq, and the, the remains of al-Qaeda in Iraq became the Islamic State, and the civil war in Syria gave them a big opportunity. So just because Barack Obama made a huge mistake is not a good reason for a new administration to come in and add some new ones. You're, you're right. I'm just, look, I, and I agree with you. I'm, my only point is it wasn't because we were insensitive that they hate us. That's all I'm saying. We're out of time. They're telling me i got to stop. David, thanks a lot for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Want to go to tonight's breaking news? Senator Jeff Sessions of Alabama has been confirmed as the Attorney General of the United States. This despite substantial opposition from many senators and grandstanding from Senator Elizabeth Warren. For more details on what exactly happened, we're joined now by Fox News correspondent Trace Gallagher. Trace? And Tucker, as expected, Sessions was mostly confirmed along party lines, but those party lines appear to be drawn deep in the sand with friction in the upper chamber growing by the hour. During the confirmation process, Massachusetts Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren attempted to read a 1986 statement by Coretta Scott King, the late widow of Martin Luther King Jr. The letter opposed Sessions' then nomination as a federal district judge, accusing him of intimidating elderly black voters. Here's what happened. Watch. Mr. President, I am surprised that the words of Coretta Scott King are not suitable for debate in the United States Senate. I ask leave of the Senate to continue my remarks. Is there objection? Object. I appeal the ruling. Object. Objection is heard. You heard the objection. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell accused Senator Warren of breaking a Senate rule against impugning a fellow senator and blocked her from speaking for the remainder of the debate. That, in turn, sparked a backlash from Democrats, with Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy tweeting, quote, rules against criticizing other senators cannot apply when you are debating the nomination of a senator. Senate Majority Whip John Cornyn described the past week in the Senate as a, quote, race to the bottom in terms of decorum. Meantime, while we await the ruling from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on the fate of President Trump's temporary travel ban, the president blasted the courts, calling them political. At a meeting in D.C. with local sheriffs and police chiefs, Trump said the law allowing him to, quote, suspend the entry of all aliens is simple enough for a bad high school student to understand. Watch. I don't ever want to call a court biased, so I won't call it biased. And we haven't had a decision yet. But courts seem to be so political. And it would be so great for our justice system if they would be able to read a statement and do what's right. The president previously called federal judge James Robart, who issued the restraining order against the temporary travel ban, a, quote, so-called judge. And a short time ago, President Trump's Supreme Court nominee Neil Gorsuch told Connecticut Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal that the president's comments on judges are, quote, disheartening and demoralizing. The White House says Gorsuch was merely stating his views. And President Trump stated his views when Nordstrom dropped his daughter's label, tweeting, quote, My daughter Ivanka has been treated so unfairly by Nordstrom. She is a great person, always pushing me to do the right thing. Terrible. 
Critics say by blasting Nordstrom, the president is further blurring the line between his administration and his family business. Here's the White House response. For someone to take out their concern with his policies on a family member of her, his is just is not acceptable. And the president has every right as a father to stand up for them. Nordstrom says this was strictly a business decision, but the company, we should note, has issued a statement supporting immigrants in the wake of the temporary travel ban. Tucker. Thanks a lot, Trace. Up next, Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts made herself the champion of the Democrats' opposition to Jeff Sessions. We'll talk to radio show host Hugh Hewitt about what this means for Senator Warren's future. Also, Republicans fought hard to block President Obama's agenda, and now Democrats are determined to take obstructionism to the next level against this president. We'll talk to a House member, a Democrat, who says his party's actually been pretty accommodating, despite appearances. That's coming up. Well, the U.S. Senate may not have many rap artists, but it can still have rap-style feuds. The latest one is between Democrat Elizabeth Warren and Republican Majority Leader Mitch McConnell of Kentucky. Earlier this hour, you saw the spat between the two, and McConnell silenced Warren on the Senate floor after she tried to suggest that Jeff Sessions is a racist. Well, the press immediately attempted to turn Warren into a martyr over her silencing. So was McConnell's move a smart one or a dumb one? Hugh Hewitt is a longtime and wise observer of all this. He's the host of The Hugh Hewitt Show, a nationally syndicated radio program. He's also the author of a new book called The Fourth Way, The Conservative Playbook for a Lasting GOP Majority, and he joins us now. Hugh, thanks a lot for coming on. So, Tucker, thanks for having me. So this was, I mean, no one disputes this was within and consistent with Senate rules. Um, but yep. needless to say, the reaction was, you know, Mitch McConnell's a sexist. He can't handle strong women. Was this a wise play politically long term? It's a brilliant move by the leader for a couple of reasons. One, he is trying to restore a chamber that Harry Reid destroyed, Tucker. Harry Reid left almost every Senate tradition in tatters. All of the pillars are down and they're at each other's throats. And Mitch McConnell, if you read his memoir, The Long Game, he really is a traditionalist. He would like to restore the decorum and the process to the Senate. But in my view, as a Republican, as a partisan, making Elizabeth Warren the face of the Democratic Party is a brilliant stroke. I mean, if they can tag team her, with Bernie Sanders, and you can have a liberal law professor from Massachusetts and a socialist from Vermont tag team the leadership of the Democratic Party. I am very happy. The last time a left wing law professor led the Democratic Party, at the end of his eight years, they were down 12 net seats in the Senate, uh, 50 plus seats in the House, 14 governorships, and 900 state legislators. So I'm all for left-wing law professors becoming the face of the Democratic Party. Really? I mean, I don't know. The, I mean, I see your point. I think it's a smart point. But I also think, in fact, I'd bet money that if Elizabeth Warren had received the Democratic nomination, she'd be the president right now. Because she is in line oh. with what Democratic voters think. She has a worldview. She can articulate it and agree with it. But it's, it's, she, she's not just an identity politics person. She's got a consistent left-wing economic view that has a lot of support in the country. She is also a very good law professor. I want to give her credit where credit is due. Tom Cotton had her in class and said she's a fine law professor. But honestly, Tucker, I don't think Hillary Clinton was that bad of a candidate that Elizabeth Warren would have been so much better she would have won. America is a center-right country, as noted by those other elections I pointed out, the loss of the Senate, the loss of the House, the loss of the, uh, the governorships, the 900 state legislators. Elizabeth Warren is hard left. Dodd-Frank is yeah, not she working. Is. She stands for, she stands for a, a, an economics that has got absolutely very little constituency outside of the echo chamber of the Democratic Party. So I, I do believe it is great for Mitch McConnell to throw rules at a law professor and say, live by the rules of the Senate. <laughs> so I, I also in this debate, and I'm sure you followed the debate, such as it was, over Senator Sessions, his confirmation, um, you heard people say just about everything about him. Cedric Richmond, who's a Democratic congressman from Louisiana, compared him to Bull Connor, which even 10 years ago would have been a pretty heavy thing to say. I wonder now if anyone even noticed. I mean, if everyone is Bull Connor, is anyone Bull Connor? Does this kind of rhetoric even have an effect anymore, do you think? That, that's the key question, Tucker. It's very dispiriting. I've worked for two attorney general, Attorney General Bill Smith, Attorney General Ed Meese. They're both fine men. Jeff Sessions is arguably the best prepared man to be attorney general in the last 50 years. Deputy, assist, uh, Deputy Assistant uh, U.S. Attorney, uh, United States Attorney, State Attorney General, 
four times the United States Senator on the Senate Judiciary Committee. Everybody in the Democratic caucus knows better than what they said. They will tell you that off the record. And it is yeah. disgraceful what they said about Sessions. He'll be a great AG. And, and I just do think all standards have gone. And I blame uh, Harry Reid, who, by the way, also enabled Jeff Sessions to get confirmed by using the Reid rule to destroy the filibuster. But it's Harry Reid's legacy. It's a mess. It's a completely uncivil place that I don't know that, that Mitch McConnell can repair even if he wants to. And I'm yeah. not sure we want to repair it until after Gorsuch is confirmed. It's a pretty uncivil country, though, all of a sudden. Uh, so you just wrote a book on the fourth way. What's the fourth way? Fourth way is the, uh, the, the succession to uh, FDR's first way, big government, Ronald Reagan's attempt to roll it back, Tony Blair and Bill Clinton's third way to rebrand it. The fourth way is merging what Donald Trump wants to do, infrastructure, which I think he should get, a 350-ship Navy, which I think he should get, the wall, which he should get, regulatory reform, and Reagan Republicanism, Paul Ryan Republicanism. We need entitlement reform. So the fourth way is a merger of the two brands of Republicanism out there right now. President Trump won. He should get what he wants. And Paul Ryan is actually the soul of our ideology. And, huh. uh, you know, big, big reforms on the entitlement side. And that's wow. the way to do it. Merge them. Boy, if you can, if you, those groups can live together, that would be formidable. Hugh Hewitt, thanks a lot for this. Tucker Carlson, always a pleasure. Send your last guest, would you, a copy of The Looming Tower? He needs to read a little bit. <laughs> I may. Thank you, Hugh. Okay. Uh, the nominees from the Trump administration are being confirmed at the slowest pace ever. Democrats are already talking impeachment. We'll talk to one Democratic congressman who says his party's behavior hasn't been that bad, actually. That's next. The Democrats in Congress are opposed to Donald Trump's presidency in every conceivable way. Cabinet nominees are confirmed at their slowest pace since George Washington's first term. Some Democrats already talking about impeachment. A new political poll says most Democrats support obstruction. Does that mean this will continue the gridlock? Democratic Congressman Jim Hines of Connecticut says despite this obstructionism, Democrats had been more accommodating than Republicans were under the previous president. He joins us now from Baltimore. Congressman, thanks for joining us. So it does hey, seem... Tucker. And I look, I think that the Republicans did oppose uh, President Obama pretty much from the beginning, but they didn't call for his impeachment two weeks in. I mean, this does seem like a new standard of unreasonableness. Yeah, but Tucker, the Democrats are not calling for the president's impeachment just because no. a couple or one or two or three may have. They're not calling for his impeachment. Most of us recognize that if he commits a high crime or a misdemeanor, and oh, by the way, the political realities of this are such that until, and this will happen, but until a majority of the Republicans in the House see him as a political liability, it ain't happening. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's true, but still, it's, it's pretty, it's, it says something. So, I mean, just for example, you, you had these votes and you had the, the Senate Minority Leader, Chuck Schumer, voted against Elaine Chao at Transportation, who was, of course, married to Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader. Like, what principle was he upholding by voting against Elaine Chao? Did he really think she was, like, an extremist or racist or something? Like, what was that? I, I, I don't know, but look, it's, 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 I, I, I don't know what's in Chuck Schumer's head, but, but no, there's no question that what used to be a body of great comedy of people working together and showing great deference to each other is not that anymore. And it's not just Chuck Schumer. Look, a lot of Democrats are still smarting over the fact that Judge Gorsuch, who by all accounts is a widely respected jurist, nonetheless is going to take a seat that Mitch McConnell decided without historical precedent and certainly without rooting in the Constitution that President Obama wasn't going to get to even get a hearing in the Senate. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it seems to be a pretty ugly place these days, but you can hardly pin the blame on uh, on Democrats here. Well, you, I mean, they share part of the blame, but I think you make a, you make a fair point. They didn't even have a hearing uh, on Merrick Garland, and, and I think they should have. Okay, so I agree with you on that. Right. But what I worry about is that there are a lot Where of ideas that? that Trump has that Democrats under normal circumstances would be open to. They say they believe in these things, and yet because they're calling him a Nazi, they won't even... Talk about them. So just for example, throw a couple. Infrastructure, Canadian drug reimportation, no entitlement reform. I mean, these are things that Democrats have supported for like a generation. Are they going to meet him on these things? Are they going to support them, even though they come from Trump? Yeah, but Tucker, step, step back a second. Calling him a Nazi? Come on. What if we'd characterize the entire Republican Party as Joe Wilson, who shouted out that the president was a liar? You've always got your loud mouths in, 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 in both parties. The Democratic Party is not calling President Trump a Nazi. We're calling him profoundly pr uh, problematic. I sit on the Intelligence Committee. I spend a good part of my day looking at what Russia is trying to do to us and what they did to us in the election, and yet the, the new president finds it in 
in his day to call out Nordstrom's, to call a judge, a so-called judge, to attack the media, but he hasn't made one critical comment okay. about Russia. I mean, okay. you, right. you're still, you're still, I think we've, we've talked here. about this before. And by the way, if you can actually find evidence that they influenced the outcome of the election, I, well, let's, do, let's do an hour on it. Okay, But I want to get to the oh, issue. Is that really the quick. standard that they succeeded? It's not that they tried. It's that they succeeded. That's the but this standard? is relevant in any way to the lives of anybody other than Democratic Congress. Relevant. Like be, but we can do a special uh, on it. But let me just let me just get to the policies here. So this is an esoteric one, but it's been uh, up for debate for 20 years. Canadian drug reimportation, the idea that you could buy drugs from Canada, they're cheaper, American-made, but coming from Canada. No Republicans been for this. Trump is for this. Democrats have always said, we're for this. Will they be for it when Trump suggests it? You know, you make a very good and valuable point here, and it's a valuable point because you're absolutely right. Look, coming from Connecticut, where I come from, I am I am so hungry for an infrastructure plan that helps the fact that you know so that one of the biggest economic drags in my part of the world is is that people can't get to work in the morning. So yeah, you know what? Whatever else Trump says, uh, if he gets serious about infrastructure, you almost can't not work with the Republicans to make that happen. And you're right, drug reimportation, any number of things. But the, re the, the the reason this is really disappointing is that when he really goes off the rails. When when he, you know, when he starts, uh, when he starts sort of apparently supporting Russia, when he starts calling out judges, when he starts damaging things like the freedom of the press, the window begins to close. As, as you've pointed out, you, you hear it from elements of our party already saying, under no circumstances should you work with this guy. Now, by the way, that's exactly what the Republicans did eight years ago, so I'm hardly going to criticize that instinct. But it is sad, because he has said some things that we would love to work with on, but by God, he's closing that window pretty rapidly. I mean, somebody, who, whose interest are you serving? I mean, what you're saying is he says naughty things on Twitter or he doesn't have a lot of self-control. Therefore, I'm not going to work on behalf of my constituents for things I've said for years I was for. I mean... That is, how did is that I, Did I just say that? I, I, I just well, made the point. I'm that I, I think I used the word I would said, be really hungry. I, I, I think, I think that, you know, uh, try as you might, Tucker, what I said was I, I would be really hungry to work on infrastructure, to work on some of the things that he's talked about, but the political realities are such that if he keeps behaving the way he's behaving, and look, this, his behavior appalls Republicans as much as it repels uh, Democrats. If he keeps doing that, he's gradually closing a window, which will make it harder and harder to reach a across the aisle. No, look, I, I have all kinds of needs in my district, and I want to work with a Republican president. But there does come a point, and it's not just being naughty on Twitter, Tucker. It's, it's striking at the very foundations of the freedom of the press, of how the intelligence community serves the president. That's the not freedom just of the press, being naughty really, on Twitter. I think the Obama administration actually pulled the phone records of one of our, our reporters here at Fox because they didn't like what he was reporting. I don't remember a lot of Democrats, you know, passing symbolic resolutions denouncing that on behalf of, of the free press. Or when so the I wasn't happy about that either. Here, I, can't remember, I can't remember if I spoke up about it. Look, I, there were things in the Obama administration. But, but, Tucker, try as you might, just because you can find one example of a naughty thing that the other administration did does not justify far more egregious violations. Look, President Obama never called it the failing New York Times. He never even picked on you guys, even though he was more than warranted in doing so. So trying to what? draw an equivalence here is just absurd. I think I was a little more attentive to the former president's statements on the press, perhaps, than you no, were. But anyway, I just hope that the Fox issues can rise, can rise to the fore. Congressman, thanks for joining us tonight. Thanks, Tucker. Well, dozens of veterans died while waiting for care at the VA facility in Phoenix, Arizona. The deaths caused a national outrage, as you remember. President Obama had this to say at the time. Over the last few months... We've discovered some inexcusable misconduct at some VA health care facilities. Stories of our veterans denied the care they needed, long wait times being covered up, cooking the books. This is wrong. It was outrageous. Wrong. Outrageous. He was indignant. Various government officials swore the facility would improve. The question is, did it improve? We sent our Will Carr to investigate that. Will, what'd you find? Well, Tucker, they've really had a revolving door of directors there in Phoenix. The latest director tells me that they're making significant improvements, but some of the veterans and whistleblowers we spoke with say that nothing could be further from the truth, and they actually question the latest director and her troubled resume, and they ask if she's really the one who can turn things around. 
Three years after dozens of veterans' deaths were blamed in part on a lack of care at the Phoenix VA, one of the original whistleblowers, Brandon Coleman, says recent investigations show the facility is still a disaster. After the scandal hit in April of 2014, money poured into this place like there was no tomorrow. The annual budget was increased over $100 million per year, and yet wait times continue to get worse. Veterans continue to die. Recently revealed internal VA rankings show the Phoenix VA is still one of the worst in the country, raising big questions for it's director Rima Nelson, who took over in October of last year. In your mind right now, on a scale of 1 to 10, overall, what do you think the status of this facility is compared to 2014? I wasn't here in 2014, and so I don't have all the details. Um, I know what happened um, uh, with the access issue in 2014, but I'm going to stay away from a rating because I don't have all the information. Well, let me ask it this way. What do you think the rating is of the facility right now compared to where you want it to get to be? Where I want it, well, uh, all of us would want it to be a 10 if the scale is from 1 to 10, but we're not there. Where, where are you realistically right now? I, I, I won't give that number only because we have a lot of work to do still. Nelson is the seventh director to run the Phoenix VA since the scandal broke in 2014. And while she's been tasked to turn things around, she comes with baggage of her own. Nelson ran the St. Louis VA from 2009 to 2013. During that time, the hospital had to notify more than 1,800 patients they had potentially been exposed to hepatitis and HIV after dental instruments were found to be unsanitary. Federal investigators also found a dialysis patient died after failing to get adequate care. Do you understand why after everything that's happened at this facility, uh, veterans would have concerns about what happened in St. Louis? I understand because if they read the headlines, the headlines would uh, paint a different story. Nelson says she took action. Then in 2013, she was transferred to the VA facility in the Philippines. When announcing her appointment in Phoenix, David Shulkin, an Obama holdover who's now President Trump's VA secretary nominee, was pressed about Nelson's past. But when we looked at these issues, we actually saw a leader who was decisive acting with veterans' interests. But recent investigations show that problems both before and after Nelson started continue to plague the facility. A recent Office of Special Counsel investigation found at least one veteran's death in 2015 could have been prevented had he received a proper exam. Investigators also found the Phoenix VA continues to struggle with significant wait times. Air Force veteran Ricky Barnes has been receiving care at the hospital for almost two decades and says his appointments continue to be delayed or canceled. Appointments are being extended beyond 30 days to 40 days. Right now? Right now. The latest wait time turmoil was brought forward by whistleblower Cuauhtémoc Rodriguez. In January, federal investigators thanked him for his courage, but Rodriguez, who continues to work at the Phoenix facility, says he's now facing fierce retaliation. It's been a, a living hell. Uh, I get excluded from everything. Um, my, my duties have been stripped for me f since day one, since they knew I was a whistleblower. He says that he's been curtailed on the programs that he's working with. I, I can't give you a specific response because I don't know of any specific action that that would um, that would um, I don't know specific response that would address that um, directly but if you found out there was retaliation we would do something about it but Rodriguez says he has email proof that Nelson is aware of the retaliation claims yet nothing has changed and now he and nearly half a dozen veterans we spoke with say the only hope for the men and women who served our country and now depend on the Phoenix VA lies in the new administration. We need a bulldog in there somewhere. Dr. David Shulkin set to be confirmed as VA secretary later this week. He says his top priorities are to cut through red tape and increase trust in the VA. And he obviously has a long way to go. Tucker, I spoke with Senator John yeah. McCain, who actually passed a choice act back in 2014 for this. Senator McCain told me today it is a national shame that these problems are still going on. Tucker. It's a tough place to run. Well, thanks a lot for that. Up next, a little note is bureaucratic change from the Department of Agriculture could imperil thousands of lab animals, including many dogs. We'll talk to someone who's sounding the alarm on that and not a minute too soon. Stay tuned. This is an overlooked move. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has, for some reason, stopped publicly providing a large amount of animal welfare information on its website. For example, lab inspection reports have been removed from the database, with the department saying they raised privacy concerns. 
It might sound like a minor bureaucratic shuffle, but animal welfare advocates say thousands of dogs and cats used in animal testing could needlessly die as a result of this. Kevin Chase is the vice president of the Beagle Freedom Project, an animal welfare group, and he joined us in the studio yesterday along with his beagle called George. Watch. Kevin Chase, thanks for joining us. Thank you. So if I've got this right, USDA has taken offline, among other things, inspection reports, animal welfare reports that were available to the public. And they're doing this in the name of, quote, transparency, kind of an Orwellian spin on it. Why did they do this and what are the implications of it? Why they did it is anybody's guess. It's clearly not in the name of transparency. Um, all commercial animal facilities across the country, it's about 7,000 of them, 1,200 of which are laboratories, all went black on Friday. Organizations like ours, government watchdog groups, the press, relies on this USA, USDA database for our work. And our charity alone, we use this database every day to identify which laboratories are using dogs and cats so we can reach out to them saying, when you're done with the research, we will take a dog just like George Washington who came from a laboratory here in the area and will provide him a great home, but we have to be able to know who has these dogs. And without this database, it's complete silence. And so what happens, I hate even to ask this question because it's so upsetting, but what happens to the dogs if no one takes the dogs? They're summarily killed. That is the standard operating procedure in a lot of places. And so if they don't get an invitation from a rescue charity like Beagle Freedom Project, then sadly many of these dogs do die. So just to be clear, and I'm, I'm very pro you know, animals, yeah. some of the animal rights groups are lunatic and resort to violence. Mm -hmm. And so you're not one of those. I mean, you're not planning to go attack a testing facility or firebomb anything, Eagle right? Freedom Project has existed for five years, and what we've worked with laboratories in 36 states and eight countries. Um, we've rescued well over 1,000 animals from laboratories, given them a second chance at life. And a part of our program, too, is we follow up with the researchers that actually gave us the dogs, showing them pictures of the dogs in the new homes, because our message is this. No matter where you fall on that animal testing debate, whether right. you think it's a tragic necessity or a moral atrocity, there's a common middle ground, and that's we should be able to find homes for the survivors. And without this USDA database, we don't even, if a lab open tomorrow, a university starts using dogs tomorrow in Virginia or Maryland or anywhere else in the country, we won't know. We won't be able to approach them. So clearly this was a result of lobbying by somebody, and, I, and the interested parties are probably pretty obvious. I wouldn't want to speculate beyond that. And this often happens in transitions between administrations. People have their pit issues, yeah. and they use the first couple of weeks to get them through. It does seem a little weird, though, as a first move this. Were you notified that this was going to happen? We had no idea that this was going to happen. We use it every day. And so we're really hopeful that this is a transition issue, like you're saying, and that the president, President Trump, ran on a campaign and got into office on a law and order campaign. And without this database, the people breaking the law and being sanctioned for animal cruelty and violations of the Animal Welfare Act are now hidden and unaccountable. And so we're really hoping the president will call somebody at the USDA yes. and put this back online. Well, that's exactly why I wanted to have you on. Yeah. The government is so big and so many things happen and exactly. things fall through the cracks and you never know what's really going on. This is one specific case where we can say, you know, this is obviously not serving the public at all. So to the testing question, I think like a lot of people, I'm on the tragic necessity side. It horrifies me that it happens. On the other hand, if it's between a child and a dog, I mean, reluctantly, you'd probably go with the child. Of course you would. On the other hand, I fear as a longtime Washington resident that funding drives some of this experimentation beyond the point that it's necessary, that's redundant because they're getting money. NIH grants. Is that true? It is. There is a lot of waste within the NIH. This $12 billion a year budget that goes to fund a lot of these controversial animal experiments that are redundant. They've been done. Many of them have failed. Sometimes the researchers even know that this cannot replicate what they've already done, but they'll do the research on the dog or whatever animal anyways because they have the funding and why not? Before you hurt a dog, you should have to prove that there's a, a good reason to do that. 100%. And Beagle Freedom Project, while we don't like animal testing, and we go out of our way to actually provide grants to universities to pioneer new models and methodologies to replace dogs like George Washington in laboratories. We just gave a $50,000 grant to John Hopkins yesterday for their evidence-based uh, toxicology collaboration. We want there to be a day where we don't use these animals in labs and we're willing to Thank work you. with the research community, help fund the non-animal alternatives, and then also take those dogs that survive and give them a good home. Who could say no to this? I agree. God bless you. You're, you're really doing a, 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 the Lord's work, so thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, Kevin.
Up next, the university is trying to deal with outraged students after it dared to offer a scholarship to men. Critics say it's sexist, even though female scholarships are just fine. That breaking story, just ahead. Well, disproportionate outrage over incredibly minor problems isn't just an American phenomenon, sadly. According to the Sydney Morning Herald in Australia, several students at the University of Sydney are furious because the university's veterinary school is offering a scholarship aimed at, brace yourself, men. The veterinary school is already 90% female, by the way, and it does offer scholarships for women that nobody objects to. Nevertheless, Imogene Grant, the women's officer on the students'